Welcome back, traders and investors. We have Nick Shaheen on creating income with option spread. Nick, how you doing today? I'm doing great. How about yourselves? Good, good. We're having fun today uh, talking about Twitter. No one's selling Twitter uh, from the lockup, so we can go into that uh, in a few minutes. But uh, first, uh, let's talk about Apple. Dennis was talking about a trade that he put on on Friday. We kind of talk about you know the open interest. We've talked about it with you, how sometimes it can act as a collar on a stock during the weekly expiration. So he nibbled on the uh, 600, 605 call spread yet on Friday, and he wants to know where to get out. So yeah, so Nick, I put on, I bought the 600 on Friday when the stock was around 592, bought the 600, sold the 605, a little opposite to what you do because you're usually selling call spreads. Well, I bought a call spread here. Obviously, the stock is uh, trading right around flat here this morning. So when you're working out of these things, do you hold them to expiration? You usually work out of them ahead of time, right? Yeah, uh, I'm not holding anything uh, these days. So whenever I see green in my portfolio, I'm cashing it in, uh, Dennis, because uh, you can't bank on anything these days. I mean, they're selling at the drop of a hat. Uh, the, the leaders were uh, momentum stocks and just what they are, their name insinuates their momentum. Apple is not momentum, but when they're start when we start seeing you know minus three, minus four percent in some names we recognize, you know they're selling everything after that. So I, I would do two things. I mean, Apple has some legs just because everybody wants it to run, and it broke six hundred after many tries. I thought that it should have rolled over to six hundred when it failed within pennies last week. It was very disappointing. Um, last week, it was definitely shortable, the 600 line. This week, it is resistance, even as of this morning, um, even though it's over 600, but there's a heck of a lot of calls open in 600. Yeah. So, so yeah, I would do two things. I, was e I would either cash out of it since you've already made some money and you miss out on some more money, but you at least made money, or I would sell a call spread higher to finance some of it just in case it retracts a little bit, then you made some money. So if I want to sell the call spread, you what do the six oh five six ten or something like that or six six oh five is another line of um, resistance about half as big as the six hundred line. The six oh two and a half is about half the size of a six oh five, so that's not strong enough for me to stand behind it above it and sell. Uh, the six ten looks about very solid, very solid. Uh, so, but but you know, six hundred is resistance. Six six oh two oh five is about one quarter of it. Six oh five is about one half of the six hundred. But they're all resistance, so they're all calls. Unless market makers, you know, change their mind and completely change the uh, uh, open interest tomorrow morning by tomorrow morning, it looks like there's more resistance here. But everybody wants it up, and I saw somebody at least uh, moved it up as far as uh, price target this morning or overnight. So yeah, I've got it on for ninety cents, and I it closed around two ten. So I'm come on, man, cash it in, cash it in. Pass out as a double, get out of there. <laughs> yeah, what do you want? Jeez, I want the whole thing. I'm greedy. I know, isn't that the way it's supposed to be? You got greed is good. I remember Gecko. What he said, greed is good. Oink <laughs> oink. oink. Oink, yeah. oink. <laughs> so, Nick, when you see that kind of open interest in the calls and whatnot, I mean, are, are you tempted to, you know, do a little bit of a fade here? I mean, it's interesting. You're saying, you know, here the stock's trading at 601.23, but, uh, you know, in your mind, based on the open interest, you're still seeing, you know, you still think 600 is uh, resistance here. Are, are, you, uh, are, are you tempted to play it from the other side here or, or I, just I, an observation? I, I, I'm, I'm not. I, I, I don't want to short Apple just because now yesterday also Icon was pretty bullish Apple and he said I might do this and he kind of announced what he wants to do but he, he didn't announce it but he may re-announce it and then we might have another little pop and so I there's no reason for me I mean there's easier shorts out there than Apple the the, the SBX is an easier short than Apple right here okay let's so, talk about that let's talk about uh, the S&P's then what uh, yeah last what week Apple and the SBX, you know, I was sending out my morning letters uh, to the members telling them about hard lines where, you know, the SBX had clear resistance lines and, and a resistance band. I think it was last week, 1885 to 95. You know, every day it changed a little bit, $5 up or down. But it was definitely shortable. 1900 was still a wall. And the 600 was a wall for Apple. And I had a lot of people selling credit cost spreads. And every morning they tell me, 
uh, you know, I did this and I did that. And I say, well, make sure you make it an iron condor <laughs> to give yourself, meaning they take the long side as well with a credit foot spread. So they bet long at a certain line, like 1850 or 1840 on the SPX, and then they try to short it. This just um, gives you the chance of reacting um, on a pop. If, if, price, if price moves against you, then you have one leg that's benefiting, one side of the trade that's benefiting a little bit, so you can close the whole thing neutral. Okay. All right. Uh, any other uh, potential shorts out there? Uh, short wise, I'm I'm trying to find longs. <laughs> so what I'm doing is I'm trying to I'm trying to go long Apple via could have put spread long Google and names that I recognize names that I know will hold up in a sell off because everybody is expecting a sell off. But I'm also hedging my bet by shorting the Nasdaq, for example, like shorting an NDX June credit call spread that's about seven or eight percent out of the money. It's twenty-five dollars wide, but it, it's big dollars and it hedges the, the whole basket of longs that I have. So if I go along Apple and Google, why not hedge via like a you know a thirty-eight twenty-five, thirty-eight fifty credit call spread in, in NDX? It's a twenty-five dollars wide spread, meaning that it's a lot it's a lot of risk. But if you have if you have the margin and the discipline to close out of it if it starts going against you, you can collect a couple of bucks in premium okay. per contract. All right. Uh, just uh, go ahead, Dennis. Did you have something for No, Nick? I was just saying he was breaking up a little bit there for me, so I'm not sure if that is on my end or not. But uh, I think it's what do you Skype. think of what do you think of Twitter here? I just uh, had the quickest losing trade in the history of losing trades here. I was trying to buy Joel's pre-market low at 36.56, and I had to get out when it cut through the 36.50 here. So now it's down at 36.38. Is this dog ever going to stop going down here, Nick? Or You know, uh, at Twitter, it, it's a complete coin flip here. Um, Dennis, I, I don't know. I wouldn't put any money on the long side or short side. With I don't know how to trade it. I can tell you one thing. Uh, you, you, you said, is the low in? I say the low cannot be in because if markets are at tops here, at highs, markets in general, and everybody expects more, uh, uh, expects a drop more than a pop as far as markets, how can Twitter be up unless it has specific news? And they just had the opportunity to give us specific news with their earnings and they didn't. So like I say, until they show us how they're going to make money, who's going to buy it? Yeah. And there's a lot of people coming on the board looking like they're selling today with this lockup expiring. 480 million shares eligible to be sold here now. So the float just got a hell of a lot bigger. Yeah, but they're no, nobody's selling, right? So <laughs> <laughs> somebody's no, selling. Nobody at all. There's nobody selling today. That, that's just you know that 3.6 million shares that have traded here in the last 45 minutes or last yeah. hour. That's you know just phantom volume. That's not real it, volume. If if one that's is just high frequency traders, they don't really count. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, you know that's the other thing. The other day, I think it was Cass. Doug Cass was on your show and he talked about high frequency traders. Jumping jumping subjects completely here. That's okay. But, uh, he he said that anyway. The concern was that liquidity or not liquidity. You know, high frequency. They say eighty percent, whatever the percentage is of trades are high frequency trades. Well. To me, that what's the point of that percentage? It's nothing except that telling us that if they're front running, they're basically buying ahead of us and selling to us. So if that if they get out, that means the trades won't go away. They just happen without them. So eighty percent of the trades will have less stacks on them, basically. So it's not like they're going to go away and then the market's going to come to a crawl. The trades are going to happen. They're just not going to be involved in it. So the, the concern with high frequency trade is that somebody's taxing my trades, but I'm just a small minnow swimming in a sea of sharks, so I, I really don't care about high frequency trading. I always just say if you pay the spread, you kind of take them out of the game a little bit. It's like they're the market makers of old here, and they're sitting there obviously on the biddings and the offers, and they're making markets. And a lot of it, you know, there's a little few other games in there too, but for the most part, a lot of it's old school market making. So if you're sitting there on the bed and you're trying to get done, and they're stepping ahead of your order, then it's a little bit challenging. But if you're just willing to lift the offer, if you're trading thicker stocks, um, they don't, they definitely don't impact you as much as if you're trading like thinner stuff. Yeah, I, I, I guess it's the big guys that feel the, the pain of high-frequency trading, but at, at, our, at the retail level of the average bear out there, or I shouldn't say bear, oh. the average trader out there, oh. I, I don't think it matters much. 
I think the big thing is just the fact that it's difficult, a little more difficult to maybe get your limit order filled. And that's why I try not to use as many limit orders. That's what we always teach our guys at Bright Trading is the high-frequency traders kind of monopolize the top of the order queue. So that's why we like to stick in the big stuff. I mean, they're there. They're, they're trading the big stuff like crazy. But if you've got a one-cent spread and you're lifting the offer, you're kind of taking them out of the game. That's the, It's the slippage. You just don't want the slippage there from that. Yeah. Uh, what are... What are Let's see the the big picture. We always talk about the, the big picture. I, I feel like I don't know about you guys, but uh, let's talk about the Merkel Obama thing that when they spoke okay. about Ukraine, I, I felt like they were trying to kick the can until the elections happened over there in Ukraine. And uh, I don't know if that's good or bad. I think it's bad because the situation is getting more violent. So we might have like a two week period of just lollygagging around here with nothing going on with regards to big moves. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm selling some iron condors and uh, small caps and the SPX. So on the small caps, but uh, today I might sweat a little bit because I see they're down about point, you know, in the pre-market a little harder than the, the broader markets, but uh, I do I do have a hedge on it, and it's a couple week week old trade. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to try to range that. Uh, what but, um, what uh, what uh, vehicle are you using to sell those iron condors? I'm doing RUT just because okay. it's bigger premium, and I have more luck using it than the IWM. But you can certainly do it with the IWM. Okay. And what could... specific contracts are you doing there? Just explain the trade just to our listeners. Sure. Um, they're, they're May contracts. You can go out to June and get, get much wider um, and then have much more success. Uh, like, um, But the May contract, you, you have to be aggressive on the credit put spread. Uh, it pays about a dollar now and uh, somewhere on the 1090 area. Uh, you, you, you sell a uh, credit put spread there. That's about $5 wide. And on the upper end of the scale, I started out with 11.75, 11.80. I collected 50 cents for it uh, last week, but that is down to 20 cents. So I have a 30 cents profit there. The trade is even now. Actually, it's a little positive because I also have a debit put spread, which I cashed in yesterday at the low, um, which was a protective uh, put there. So you kind of have to know what you're doing there in order to pull it off. But anybody that sells spread knows what I'm talking about, and maybe they can take advantage of that, too. Do you put your Are orders in as spread orders? or you, it, I mean, is that the way you put them in there, as the actual? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, we've talked. yes, always. I never try to lug into one side of it. So if I'm doing a credit put spread, I never try to sell the 1095 and buy the 1090 separately. A, that's an extra cost, and B, with these fast markets, <laughs> you can end up uh, costing yourself That's on one side, yeah. 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 It's not fun you when can't. you miss one side. No, it's not. No, I like to, you know, and this thing trades wide. So you got to put your order and be patient. Right. What was it? What was this one thing about that? Uh, Bob Bright had a saying about doing spreads and putting one leg in. Do you remember that, Dennis? I don't know. Uh, Bob had a lot of sayings. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure going it's back in the archives <laughs> there. But, uh, okay, so, I mean, you always talk about the macro, you know, kind of upsetting the apple cart. Uh Kind of hit over the weekend. That's what took us down on Monday. But, uh, boy, the market really turned around on a dime and uh, came back. You're not getting, uh, you know, the file through this morning. Uh, you know, what do you have? Are you going to be just adding to those positions off the opening? Just going to be maintaining no. them? Or what would, make you, what would make you to say, okay, this market is ripping the 1900? Is there, is there a, a number or a level? Is there something that, that you're looking for that would change your mind that we were blasting up to new highs? Well, a couple of things today. It is Super Tuesday, and nobody's allowed to sell unless it's Twitter. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind. This this is an opportunity for the bears today because Tuesdays has been the, uh, the, the playing field for bulls. So if the bears manage a, let's say, quiet Tuesday, then the 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 bulls might have their ego bruised. I have a couple of worries, though. The yen is spiking today. And we, we've had a, a pair trade that's been killer, an inverse pair trade where the yen and the TLT rip and then the markets and the 10-year drop. And le lately, the yen had been somewhat quiet and the TLT has been the one that's whipsawing. And this morning, they're both ripping. And the yen has been as high as a month ago. And it seems like there's a one-month spike cycle in the yen versus the dollar. So every month it rips and every two weeks in between, it rips a little bit 
less. But today it's ripping, and I worry about the markets on on rip days. I also have caution. Like last week, I read something about uh, on real estate. You know, everybody. One of the basic assumptions is that the real estate market has rebounded, and I always said that it doesn't seem like it because every time they say that. They also say half the transactions are cash. Well, those guys are investors and not home buyers. And if they smell trouble, you lose half your market. And so real estate is not a given that it's rebounded. And, and mortgage applications were as low as 2,000? Oh, my gosh. I mean, that is terrible. 2,000 so for the of, whole country? No, no. 2,000 a year. Oh, oh, okay. okay. Like in 2,000. So, oh, so, oh, wow. So, yes, that's what I said. I mean, that's a long time. So if we are rebounding, if, if the real estate market has rebounded, it's one of the assumptions that now is, it's got a question mark on it for me, for me. So nobody's talking about it, but I read it, and unless it was a bad headline, uh, um, then, you know, I, I'll take it back. But it's a worry out there. Plus, you've got the geopolitical risk. So I, I'm these- not scared. With all these worries, though, Nick, and Doug Cass was on our show last week, and he was saying how he thought there was, I think, nine different bubbles, and Doug Cass was really bearish the world here. And it seems like everybody is concerned here. Is that not the problem overall? It's that there's just too much, and the markets like to climb the wall of worry. And that's, you know, we've had worries here for the last couple of years, and the markets just continue to grind higher. What's he, when's eventually this economy, which maybe isn't doing as well as this market, going to equal price? When eventually are we going to start to get a pullback in the stocks? I, I, you know, I'm, I always say I'm not expecting doom. But uh, I'm. I don't Prepare see. The, <laughs> I, I don't. I don't see anything that's going to launch us forward. What's the headline that's going to launch us forward? World peace. Um, but, dude, I don't, but but we haven't had headlines really like that for two years, and we keep climbing this wall of worry and climbing this wall. No, we've of had headlines. We've had headlines. We've had QEs. Uh, well, we've QE, had. Yeah. We've yeah. had. Well, now we have anti QE l- lurking. So there's no QE coming. There's the, you know, the, the real estate market has quote unquote rebounded. Uh, jobs are getting better. And but, so where is the positive catalyst that's going to catapult us forward? I don't see one. So I'm not saying we're going to drop the doom, but I'm saying we may just meander here, move up a little bit and drop down. And lately, all the pops have been relief pops that nothing happened over the weekend, that the jobs report was good. It's just relief. Oh, my God, thank God, thank God. Everybody's waiting for that shoe to drop. And that's not an environment where we're going to rip higher. We may pop and and draw down a little bit. So, yes, we're at market highs, but we're, we're not going to lunge through. I would still think that, the, that this week the 1900s are shortable. The SPX, the 85 is, 1885 SPX is neutral, but 7580 might be a magnet because there's strong resistance. And then you got the 95s and the, uh, uh, and the 1900s is definitely shortable via credit cost spread. And if you want to be safe, you can go out to June and do it in the mid-1900s. So you give yourself some breathing room. Yeah, just a just, s- side note there. We The two last two pops that we made in the market were both off the unemployment reports, and we sold off both times. The last two pops. Yes, and it, and it feels like they're relief pops that, oh, my gosh, thank God it's not 100000 Well, the theme on the show here for the last week has been pops to fade. So we are, I'm just playing a little devil's advocate there with you, Nick, there too, because I've been, you know, and I kind of a bull here for a long, long time. And I've been playing out and I've talked about the scenario I may even talked about with you where I think the only problem is with, I think there's just too many people that are bearish out there here in the short term. And I think we got to shake those guys out. And I still think we're going to pop over 1900 here eventually, maybe in the next week or two. Sucker out all the shorts, shake out the shorts, sucker in some more longs, and then fall. Because the market always wants to fall when nobody is expecting it. And I think too many people are expecting it to fall. And so maybe I'm just digging too deep here. But <laughs> Dennis, what, what, that, that was your statement to me last week. And just I'm still playing that same scenario. Just before we ended the calls, the word for word. <laughs> yeah, I've still been doing it. I say it every day on the show here. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> here's here's what I told you 
today, I said, I'm long this, I'm long that, I'm long this, but I'm hedging my bet by shorting the NDX way higher than here. So I'm on the same boat. I want to be long. I'm not bearish. I'm not Doug Cass. Uh, nice guy, but I'm just not a perma bear. I, I'm a cautious guy, and I see trouble lurking possible. I don't right. see doom. We need another shoe to drop to get the doom. Uh, the givens that we have now, the variables we have now, don't tell me that we have impending doom. We need another shoe to drop. And it doesn't have to be a big one these days because everybody's headed for the exit because, like you said, everybody's worried. Everybody's nervous. So they're going to hit the sell button and then ask questions. So I want to be long, but I'm cautiously long by doing some credit call spreads or buying some debit put spreads just to hedge my bet. Okay. All right. We've had uh, Nick Shaheen on creating income with option spreads, uh, going toe to toe with Dennis here on uh, his their market theories. It's always fun to hear you guys uh, have your discussions. Uh, Nick, thanks for coming on, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Talk to you next week, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nick.